Section 68 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read to you by J.P. Liao. All About Coffee by Willem Euchers. Chapter 36. Preparation of the Universal Beverage. The Evolution of Grinding and Brewing Methods. Coffee was first a food, then a wine, a medicine, a devotional refreshment, a confection, and finally a beverage. Brewing by boiling, infusion, percolation, and filtration. Coffee making in Europe in the 19th century. Early coffee making in the United States. Latest developments in better coffee making. Various aspects of scientific coffee brewing. Advice to coffee lovers on how to buy coffee and how to make it in perfection. The coffee drink has had a curious evolution. It began not as a drink, but as a food ration. Its first use as a drink was a kind of wine. Civilization knew it first as a medicine, at one stage of its development, before it became generally accepted as a liquid refreshment, the berries found favor as a confection. As a beverage, its use probably dates back about 600 years. The protein and fat content, that is, the food value of coffee, so far as civilized man is concerned, is an absolute waste. The only constituents that are of value are those that are water-soluble and can be extracted readily with hot water. When coffee is properly made, as by the drip method, either by percolation or filtration, the ground coffee comes in contact with the hot water for only a few minutes. So the major portion of the protein, which is not only practically insoluble, but coagulates on heating, remains in the unused part of the coffee, the grounds. The coffee bean contains a large percentage of protein, 14%. By comparing this figure with 21% of protein in peas, 23% in lentils, 26% in beans, 24% in peanuts, about 11% in wheat flour, and less than 9% in white bread, we learn how much of this valuable food stuff is lost with coffee grounds. Though civilized man, excepting the inhabitants of the Ile de Gua off the coast of Brittany, does not use this protein content of coffee. In certain parts of Africa, it has been put to use in a very ingenious and effective manner from time immemorial down to the present day. James Bruce, the Scottish explorer, in his travels to discover the source of the Nile in 1768 to 1773, found that this curious use of the coffee bean had been known for centuries. He brought back accounts and specimens of its use as a food in the shape of balls made of grease mixed with roasted coffee finely ground between stones. Other writers have told how the Gala, a wandering tribe of Africa, and like most wandering tribes, a warlike one, find it necessary to carry concentrated food on their long marches. Before starting on their marauding excursions, each warrior equips himself with a number of food balls. These prototypes of the modern food tablet are about the size of a billiard ball and consist of pulverized coffee held in shape with fat. One ball constitutes one day's ration, and although civilized man might find it impalpable, from the purely psychological standpoint, it is not only a concentrated and efficient food, but it has also the additional advantage of containing a valuable stimulant in the caffeine content which spurs the warrior on to maximum effort. And so, the savage in the African jungle has apparently solved two problems, the utilization of coffee's protein and the production of a concentrated food. Further research shows that perhaps as early as 800 AD, this practice started by crushing the whole ripe berries, beans, and hulls in mortars, mixing them with fats, and rounding them into food balls. Later, the dried berries were so used. The inhabitants of Gua also thrived on a diet that includes roasted coffee beans. About 900, a kind of aromatic wine was made in Africa from the fermented juice of the hulls and pulp of the ripe berries. Payne says that the first coffee drinkers did not think of the roasting, but, impressed by the aroma of the dried beans, they put them in cold water and drank the liquor saturated with their aromatic principles. Crushing the raw beans and hulls and seeping them in water was a later improvement. It appears that boiled coffee, the name is anathema today, was invented about the year 1000 AD. Even then, the beans were not roasted. 
we read about their use in medicine in the form of a decoction. The dried fruit, beans and hulls, were boiled in stone or clay cauldrons. The custom of using the sun-dried hulls without roasting still exists in Africa, Arabia, and some parts of southern Asia. The natives of Sumatra neglect the fruit of the coffee tree and use the leaves to make a tea-like infusion. Jardin relates that in Guyana, an agreeable tea is made by drying the young buds of the coffee tree and rolling them on a copper plate slightly heated. In Uganda, the natives eat raw berries. From bananas and coffee, they make also a sweet, savory drink, which is called Minghai. About 1200, the practice was common of making a decoction from the dried hulls alone. There followed the discovery that roasting improved the flavor. Even today, this drink is known as Sultan, or Sultana coffee. Café à la Soutane, or Kisha, continues in favor in Arabia. Credit for the invention of this beverage has been wrongfully given by various French writers to Dr. Andry, director of the Facility of Medicine in Paris. Dr. Andry had his own recipe for making café à la soutane, which was to boil the coffee hulls for half an hour. This gave a lemon-colored liquid, which was drunk with a little sugar. The oriental procedure was to toast the hulls in an earthware pot over a charcoal fire mixing in with them a small quantity of the silver skins and turning them over until they were slightly parched. The hulls and silver skins, in proportion of four to one, were then thrown into boiling water and well boiled again for at least half an hour. The color of the drink had some resemblance to the best English beer. La Roque assures us, and it required no sweetening, there being no bitterness to correct. This was still the coffee drink of the court of Yemen and of people of distinction in the Levant. When La Roque and his fellow travelers made their celebrated voyage to Arabia the Happy in 1711 to 1713, sometime in the 13th century, the practice began of roasting the dried beans after the hulling process. This was done first in crude stone and earthenware trays, and later on metal plates, as described in chapter 34. A liquor was made from boiling the whole roasted beans. The next step was to pound the roasted beans to a powder with a mortar and pestle. And the decoction was then made by throwing the powder into boiling water, the drink being swallowed in its entirety, grounds and all. It was a decoction for the next four centuries. When the long-handled Arabian metal boiler made its appearance in the early part of the 16th century, the method of preparation and service had much improved. The Arabs and the Turks had made it a social adjunct, and its use was no longer confined to the physicians and the churchmen. It had become a stimulating refreshment for all the people, and at the same time, the Arabians and the Turks had developed a coffee ceremony for the higher classes, which was quite as wonderful as the tea ceremony of Japan. The common early method of preparation throughout the Levant was to steep the powder in water for a day, to boil the liquor halfway through, to strain it, and to keep it in earthen pots for use as wanted. In the 16th century, the smaller coffee broiler, or ibrik, caused the practice to be more of an instantaneous affair. The coffee was ground, and the powder was dropped into the boiling water to be withdrawn from the fire several times as it boiled up to the rim. While still boiling, cinnamon and cloves are sometimes added before pouring the liquid off into the finjans, or little china cups, to be served with the addition of a drop of essence of amber. Later, the Turks added sugar during the boiling process. From the first simple uncovered ebrick there was developed, about the middle of the 17th century, a larger size covered coffee broiler, the forerunner of the modern combustion brewing and serving pot. This was a copper-plated kettle, pattern after the oriental era with a broad base, bulbous body, and narrow neck. After having poured into it one and a half times as much water as the dish, cup, in which the drink was to be served with hold, the pot was placed on a lively fire. When the water boiled, the powdered coffee was tossed into the pot, and as the liquid boiled up, it was taken from the fire and returned probably a dozen times. Then the pot was placed in hot ashes to permit the grounds to settle. This done, the drink was served, 
Dufour, describing this process as practiced in Turkey and Arabia, says, One ought not to drink coffee, but suck it in as hot as one can. In order not to be burnt, it is not necessary to place the tongue in the cup, but hold the edge against the tongue with the lips above and below it, forcing it so little that the edges do not bear down, and then suck in. That is to say, swallow it sip by sip. If one is so delicate he cannot stand the bitterness, he can temper it with sugar. It is a mistake to stir the coffee in the pot, the grounds being worth nothing. In the Levant, it is only the scum of the people who swallow the grounds. Laroque says, The Arabians, when they take their coffee off the fire, immediately wrap the vessel in a wet cloth, which finds the liquor instantly, makes it cream at the top, and occasion a more pungent steam which they take great pleasure in snuffing up as the coffee is pouring into the cups. They, like all other nations of the East, drink their coffee without sugar. Some of the Orientals afterward modified the early coffee-making procedure by pouring the boiling water on the powdered coffee in the serving cups. They thus obtained a foaming and perfumed beverage, says Jardin, to which we, the French, could not accustom ourselves because of the powder which remains in suspension. Nevertheless, clarified coffee may be obtained in the Orient. In Mecca, in order to filter it, they strain it through stopples of dried herbs put into the opening of a jar. Sugar seemed to be introduced into coffee in Cairo about 1625. Veselingus records that the coffee drinkers in Cairo's 3,000 coffee houses did begin to put sugar in their coffee to correct the bitterness of it and that others made sugar plums of the coffee berries. This coffee confection later appeared in Paris, and about the same time, in 1700, at Montpellier was introduced a coffee water, a sort of rosa foulis of an agreeable scent that has somewhat of the smell of coffee roasted. These novelties, however, were designed to please only the most nice lovers of coffee for ennui and boredom demanded new sensations then as now. Boiling continued to the favorite method of preparing the beverage until well into the 18th century. Meanwhile, we learn from English references that it was the custom to buy the beans of apothecaries, to dry them in an oven, or to roast them in an old pudding dish or frying pan before pounding them to a powder with mortar and pestle, to force the powder through a lawn sieve and then to boil it with spring water for a quarter of an hour. The following recipe from a rare book published in London, 1662, details the manner of making coffee in the 17th century. Coffee making in 1662. To make the drink that is now much used called coffee. The coffee berries are to be bought at any druggist, about three shillings the pound. Take what quantity you please, and over a charcoal fire, in an old pudding pan or frying pan, Keep them always stirring until they be quite black. And when you crack one with your teeth, that is, black within as it is without, yet if you exceed, then you do waste the oil, which only makes the drink, and if less, then will it not deliver its oil, which must make the drink. And if you should continue fire till it be white, it will then make no coffee, but only give you its salt. The berry prepared as above, beaten and forced through a lawn sieve, is then fit for use. Take clean water and boil one-third of it away, what quantity soever it be, and is fit for use. Take one quart of this prepared water, put in it one ounce of your prepared coffee, and boil it gently one quarter of an hour, and it is fit for your use. Drink one quarter of a pint as hot as you can sip it. In England, about this time, the coffee drink was not infrequently mixed with sugar candy, and even with mustard. In the coffee houses, however, it was usually served black, without sugar or milk. About 1660, Newhoff, the Dutch ambassador to China, was the first to make a trial of coffee with milk in imitation of tea with milk. In 1685, Sir Monin, a celebrated doctor of Grenoble, France, first recommended café au lait as a medicine. He prepared it thus, place on the fire a bowl of milk. When it begins to rise, throw into it a bowl of powdered coffee, a bowl of moist sugar, and let it boil for some time. We read that in 1669, 
Coffee in France was a hot black decoction of muddy grounds thickened with syrup. Angelo Rimbaldi, in his Ambrosia Arabica, thus describes coffee making in Italy and other European countries in 1691. Description of the vase for making the decoction, dose of powder, and of the water necessary and time of boiling it. Two such vessels having a large paunch to reach the fire, two others with long necks and narrow, with a cover to restrain their spirituous and volatile particles, which when thrown off by the heat are easily lost. These vessels are called ibric in Arabia. They are made of copper, coated with white outside and inside. We who do not possess the art of making them should select an earth, vitreous sulfate of copper, or any other material adapted for kitchenware. It might even be of silver. The quantity of water and powder has no certain rule. By reason of the difference of our nature and tastes, and each one after some experience will use his own judgment to adjust to his desire and liking. Marinita infused two ounces of powder in three liters of water. Codovico, in his voyage to Jerusalem, confirms that he has observed six ounces of the former to twenty liters of the latter, boiled until it was reduced to half the quantity. Ivanut asserts that the Turks, in three cups of water, are contented with a good spoonful of powder. I have observed, however, that in Africa, France, and England, into about six ounces of water, which with them is one cup, a dram of the powder is infused, and this agrees with my taste, but I have wished at times to change the dose. Others put the water into the vase, and when it begins to boil, add the powder. But because it is full of spirit, at the first contact with the heat, it rises and boils over the edge of the vase. Take it away from the fire till the boiling ceases, then put it on the fire again and let it stay a short time boiling with the cover on. Stand it on warm ashes until it settles, after which slowly pour a little of the decoction into an earthen vessel, or one of porcelain or of any other kind, as hot as it can be borne, and drink a sip, if it pleases your taste. Add a portion of cardamom, cloves, nutmeg, or cinnamon, and dissolve a little sugar in the water. Yet because these substances will alter the taste of this simple, they are not prized by many experts. Modern Arabia, Bassa, Turkey, and the Great Orient, those who are traveling or in the army, infuse the powder in cold water, and then boiling it as directed above, bear witness to its efficacy. All times are opportune to take this salutary drink, beverage. Among the Turks are those who take it even by night, nor is there a business meeting or conversation where coffee is not taken. Among the great, it would be accounted an incivility if with smoke, coffee were not offered, and no one in the day is ashamed to frequent the bazaar where it is sold. When I was in London, the city of three million people, there were taverns for its special use. It is a great stimulant. The sober take it to invigorate the stomach. The scrofulous hated it because they thought it stirred up the bile on an empty stomach, but experience proving the contrary enjoy it as much as others. In 1702, coffee in the American colonies were being used as a refreshment between meals, like spirituous liquors. It is in 1711 that the infusion idea in coffee making appeared in France. It came in a form of a fustian, cloth, bag, which contained the ground coffees in the coffee maker, and the boiling water was poured over it. This was a decided French novelty, but it made its slow headway into England and America, where some people were still boiling the whole roasted beans and drinking the liquor. In England, as early as 1722, there arose a conscientious objector to boiled coffee in the person of Humphrey Broadbent, a coffee merchant who wrote a treatise on the true way of preparing and making coffee, in which he condemned the silly practice of making coffee by boiling an ounce of powder in a quart of water then common in the London coffee houses and urging the infusion method. He favored the following procedure. Put the quantity of powder you intend into your pot, which should be either of stone or silver, being much better than tin or copper, which takes from it much of its flavor and goodness. Then pour boiling hot water upon the foresaid powder and let it stand to infuse five minutes before the fire. This is an excellent way and far exceeds the common one of boiling 
but whether you prepare it by boiling or this way, it will sometimes remain thick and troubled after it is made, except you pour in a spoonful or two of cold water, which immediately precipitates the more heavy parts at the bottom and makes it clear enough for drinking. Some make coffee with spring water, but it is not so good as river or Thames water because the former makes it hard and distasteful and other makes it smooth and pleasant, laying soft on the stomach. If you have a desire to make good coffee in your families, I cannot conceive how you can put less than two ounces of powder to a quart or one ounce to a pint of water. Some put two ounces and a quarter. By 1760, the decoction or boiling method in France had been generally replaced by the infusion or steeping method. In 1763, Don Martin, a tinsmith of saint Bendit, France, invented a coffee pot, the inside of which was filled by a fine sack put in its entirety, and which had a tap to draw the coffee. Many inventions to make coffee sans ébullition, without boiling, appeared in France about this time, but it was not until the 1800 that de Belois pot employing the original French drip method, appeared, signaling another step forward in coffee making, percolation, de Beloit and Count Rumford. De Beloit's pot, probably made of iron or tin, afterward of porcelain, and it had served as a model for all the percolation devices that followed it for the next hundred years. It does not seem to have been patented, and not much is known of the inventor. About this period, it was the common practice in England to boil coffee in the good old-fashioned way, and to fine, clarify, it with Isinglass. This moved Count Rumford, Benjamin Thompson, an American-British scientist, then living in Paris, to make a study of scientific coffee making, and to produce an improved drip device known as Rumford's percolator. He has been generally credited with the invention of the percolator, but, as pointed out in a previous chapter, this honor seems to be de Beloy's and not Rumford's. Count Rumford embodied his observation and conclusion in a verbose essay entitled Of the Excellent Qualities of Coffee and the Art of Making It in the Pious Perfection, published in London 1812. In this treatise, he describes and illustrates the Rumford percolator. Brillet Savaret the famous French gastronomist who also wrote on coffee in his sixth meditation said of the de Beloit's pot, I have tried, in the course of time, all methods and of all those which have been suggested to me up to today, 1825, and with a full knowledge of the matter in hand. I prefer de Beloit's method, which consists of pouring the boiling water upon the coffee which has been placed in the vessel of porcelain or silver, pierced with very small holes. I have attempted to make coffee in a broiler at high pressure. I have had, as a result, a coffee full of extracts and bitterness, which could scrape the throat of a Cossack. Berlin Severin had something also to say on the subject of grinding coffee, his conclusion being that it was better to pound the coffee than to grind it. He preferred M. de Beloit, Archbishop of Paris, who loved good things and was quite an epicure, and says that Napoleon showed him deference and respect. This may have been Jean-Baptiste de Beloy, who, according to Didot, was born in 1709 and died in 1808, and, it is though likely, was the inventor of the de Beloy pot. Count Rumford was born in Woburn, Massachusetts in 1753. He was apprenticed to a shopkeeper in Salem in 1766. He became an object of distrust among the friends of the cause of American freedom, and on the evacuation of Boston by the royal troops in 1776, he was elected by Governor Wentworth of New Hampshire to carry dispatches to England. He left England in 1802 and resided in France from 1804 until his death in 1814. In 1772, he had married, or rather, as he put it, he was married by a wealthy widow, the daughter of a highly respectable minister and one of the first settlers at Rumford, now called Concord, New Hampshire. 
It was from this town that he took his title of Rumford when he was created a Count of the Holy Roman Empire in 1791. His first wife having died, he married in Paris the wealthy widow of the celebrated chemist, Lavoisier, and with her he lived an extremely uncomfortable life until they agreed to separate. In his essay on coffee and coffee making, Count Rumford gives us a good pen picture of the preparation of the beverage in England at the beginning of the 19th century. He says, Coffee is first roasted in an iron pan, or in a hollow cylinder, made of sheet iron, over a brisk fire, and when, from the color of the grain, and the particular fragrance which it acquires in this process, it is judged to be sufficiently roasted. It is taken from the fire and suffered to cool. When cold, it is pounded in a mortar, or ground in a hand mill to a coarse powder, and preserved for use. Formerly, the ground coffee being put into a coffee pot with a sufficient quantity of water, the coffee pot was put over the fire, and after the water had been made to boil a certain time, the coffee pot was removed from the fire, and the grounds having time to settle or have been bind down with isinglass, the clear liquid was poured off and immediately served in cups. Count Rumford thought it was a mistake to agitate the coffee powder in the brewing process, and in this he agreed with de Beloy. His improvement on the latter's pot is described in chapter 34. He was a coffee connoisseur and, as such, was one of the first to advocate the use of cream as well as sugar for making an ideal cup of the beverage. He refers, though not by name, to de Beloy's percolation method and says, its usefulness is now universally acknowledged. A few definitions. Just here, in order to assure a better understanding of the subject, it may be well to clear up sundry misconceptions regarding the words percolation, filtration, decoction, infusion, etc., by the simple expedient of definition. A decoction is a liquid produced by boiling a substance until its soluble properties are extracted. Thus, the coffee drink was first a decoction, and a decoction is what one gets today when coffee is boiled in the good old-fashioned way, as mother used to make it. Infusion is a process of steeping, extraction without boiling, it is extraction accomplished at any temperature below boiling and is a general classification of procedure capable of subdivision. As generally and correctly applied, it is the operation wherein hot water is merely poured upon ground coffee loose in a pot or in a container resting on the bottom of the pot. In the strictest sense of the term, an infusion is also produced by percolation and filtration when the water is not boiling in contact with the coffee. Percolation means dripping through fine apertures in china or metal, as in de Beloy's French drip pot. Filtration means dripping through a porous substance, usually cloth or paper. Percolation and filtration are practically synonyms, although a shade of distinction in their meaning has arisen so that often the latter is considered as a step logically succeeding the former. Accomplishing extraction of a material by permitting a liquid to pass slowly through it is, in fact, percolation, whereas filtration of the resultant extraction is affected by interposing in its path some medium which will remove solid or semi-solid material from it. Coffee making practice has in itself so applied these terms that each is considered a complete process. Percolation is thus applied when the infusion is removed from the grounds immediately by dripping through the fine perforations in the china or metal of which the device is constructed. True percolation is not produced in the pumping percolators, in which the heated water is elevated and sprayed over the ground coffee held in a metal basket in the upper part of the pot the liquor being recirculated until a satisfactory degree of extraction has been reached. Rather, the process is midway between decoction and effusion, for the weak liquor is boiled during the operation in order to furnish sufficient steam to cause the pumping action. Filtration is accomplished when the ground coffee is retained by cloth or paper, generally supported by some portion of the brewing device and extraction affected by pouring water on the top of the mass, permitting the liquid to percolate through. 
the filtering medium retaining the grounds. Patents and Devices From the beginning, the French devoted more attention than any other people to coffee brewing. The first French patent on a coffee maker was granted in 1802 to Denobe, Henri, and Rauch for a pharmacological chemical coffee making device by infusion. In 1802, Charles Wyatt obtained a patent in London on an apparatus for distilling coffee. The first French patent on an improved coffee drip pot for making coffee by filtration without boiling was granted to Adro in 1806. Strictly speaking, this was not a filtration device, as it was fitted with a tin composition strainer, or grid. It was very like Count Rumford's percolator announced six years later, as will be seen by comparing the two in chapter 34. In 1815, Sunet invented in France his cafetier Sunet, another device to make coffee without boiling. About the year 1817, the coffee vegan appeared in England. It was simply a squat earthenware pot with an upper movable strainer part made of tin after the French drip pot pattern. Later models employed a cloth bag suspended from the rim of the pot. It was said to have been invented by a Mr. Bacon and Dr. Murray of Dictionary Frame. Seems to have been convinced of this gentleman's existence, although others have doubted it and thought the name was of Dutch origin. The article having been first made for Holland, it has been suggested that in all probability the name came from the Dutch word bechen, to trickle or run down. One thing is certain. Coffee Biggins came originally from France, so that if there was a Mr. Biggin, he merely introduced them into England. The Coffee Biggin with which Americans are most familiar is a pot containing a flannel bag or a cylindrical wire strainer to hold the ground coffee through which the boiling water is poured. The Marion Harlan pot was an improved metal coffee biggin. The Triumph coffee filter was a cloth bag device which made any coffee pot a biggin. In 1819, Maurice, a Paris tinsmith, invented a double drip reversible coffee pot. The device had two movable filters and was placed bottom up on the fire until the water boiled when it was inverted to let the coffee filter or drip through. In 1819, Lawrence was granted a French patent on the original hump percolator device in which the water was raised by steam pressure and dripped over the ground coffee. In 1820, Godet, another Paris tinsmith, invented a filtration device that employed a cloth strainer. In 1822, Louis Bernard Rebel was granted an English patent on a coffee-making device in which the usual French drip process was reversed by the use of steam pressure to force the boiling water upward through the coffee mass. Caisseneuve of Paris was granted a patent on a similar device in France in 1824. In 1825, the first coffee pot patent in the United States was granted to Louis Martelli on a machine to condense the steam and essential oils and return them to the infusion. In 1827, the first really practical pumping percolator, as we understand the meaning today, was invented by Jacques Auguste Gondé, a manufacturer of plated jewelry in Paris. The boiling water was raised through a tube in the handle and sprayed over the ground coffee suspended in a filter basket, but could not be returned for a further spraying. In 1827, Nicolas Félix Durant a manufacturer of chalon sur mer was granted a French patent on a percolator employing, for the first time, an inner tube to raise the boiling water for spraying over the ground coffee. In 1839, James Vardy and Maurice Plateau was granted an English patent on a kind of urn percolator, or filter, employing the vacuum process of coffee making, the upper vessel being made of glass. By this time, the pumping percolator, working by steam pressure and by partial vacuum, was in general use in France, England, and Germany, and then began the movement toward the next stage in coffee making, filtration. About this time, 1840, Robert Napier, 1790 to 1876, the Scottish marine engineer, 
of the celebrated Clyde shipbuilding firm of Robert Napier and Sons, invented a vacuum coffee machine to make coffee by distillation and filtration. The device was never patented, but 30 years later, it was being made in the works of Thomas Smith and Son, Elkington and Co. LTD successors, under the direction of Mr. Napier, the aged inventor. The device consists of a silver globe, brewer siphon, and strainer, as illustrated. It operates as follows. A half cup full of water is put into the globe, and the gas fume is lighted. The dry coffee is put into the receiver, which is then filled up with boiling water. This will at once become agitated, and will continue so for a few minutes. When it becomes still, the gas flame is turned down, and the clear coffee is siphoned over into the globe through the siphon tube, on the end of which, as it rests in the coffee liquid, there is a metal strainer covered with a filter cloth. The Niperian coffee machine has enjoyed great popularity in England. The principle has in later years been incorporated in the Napier List steam coffee machine for use in hotels, ships, restaurants, etc. Steam is used as a source of heat, but does not mix with the coffee. List's patent is for an improvement on the Napierian system and was granted in 1891. It is related that shortly before he died, old Mr. Napier, at the termination of a dispute in Smith & Co.'s factory at Glasgow, where the device was being made under his instruction, said to old Mr. Smith, You may be a guild silversmith, but I'm a better engineer. In 1841, William Ward Andrews was granted an English patent on an improved pot employing a pump to force the boiling water through the ground coffee while contained in a perforated cylinder screwed to the bottom of the pot. In 1842, the first French patent on a glass coffee-making device was granted to Madame Vassieu of Léon. Following this, there were numerous patents issued in France and England on double glass globe coffee-making devices. They were first known as double glass balloons and most of them employed metal strainers. After this, there were many percolator patents in France, England, and the United States, some of which were improved forms of the original drip method of the De La Boy device. Others were the type of machine which came to be known as percolators because they employed the principle of raising the heated water and spraying it over the ground coffee in continuous fashion. The story is told in chronological order in the chapter on the evolution of coffee apparatus, so it is not necessary to repeat it here. Numerous filtration devices also were produced abroad and in the United States. Among the percolators, those of Manning, Bowman, and Co., and of Landers, Ferre, and Clark, became well known here. In the filtration field, the following attained considerable distinction. Harvey Rickers' half-minute pot employed a cotton sack with reinforced bottom, introduced about 1881. The Kinhee pot of 1990. Gouchois' private estate coffee maker, using Japanese filter paper, introduced in 1905. Finley Acker's percolator, introduced the same year, which also employed a filter paper between two cylinders having side perforations. The Triculator, 1908. King's percolator, using filter paper, in 1912. And the Make Right, 1911, with its adaptation as presented in the True Brew Pot of 1920. The Make Right was the invention of Edward Abern, New York, and comprised two telescoping open wire frames, or baskets, with a flat piece of muslin between them. In the true brew pot, the same idea was employed, except that the wire frames was so constructed as to furnish four drip points to afford better distribution on the ground coffee and to lessen the time of filtration. There was also a porcelain top, to house and to raise the filtration device above the brew with an opening through which the boiling water could be poured without exposing the ground coffee. 
among the later developments of the genuine percolator principle that have attracted attention in this country, mention should be made of the phalanx coffee maker and the gelt pot. In 1914 to 1916, there was a revival of interest in the United States in the double glass globe method of making coffee, introduced into France as double glass balloons in the first half of the 19th century. American ingenuity produced several clever adaptations and several notable filter improvements. Advertising developed a great demand for glass percolators, as they were first called, but although five attained considerable prominence, only two survived and, at this writing, are still being manufactured. Both are double glass globe filters employing a spheric lamp, gas, or electricity as heating agents. Within the last few years, it has become the fashion to obtain patents in the United States on the art of brewing coffee or the art of making coffee. Instances are the patents issued to Miser, Kalkin, and Muller. In the Kalkin patent, the phalanx device illustrated at the top of this page the art consists in controlling the flow of the boiling water by means of the number and spacing of the holes in the water spreader, so as to restrict the volume and the speed, to effect a quick initial extraction, and then, by means of a new spacing of holes in the infuser, retarding the drip to attain a prolonged extraction of the tannin and other elements of slow extraction and combining the liquid obtained during the initial and subsequent stages of the brew for attaining a balanced liquid extract. Muller's art, the apparatus is described in chapter 34, consisted in so supplying and supporting the ground coffee in an urn that is never again subjected to the decoction after having been exposed to the air and steam following the first application of the water. In 1920, William G. Goldworthy, San Francisco, was granted a United States patent on a process for preparing the beans for making the beverage. The process consisted of grinding the raw, dried beans, then packing the ground product in non-combustible and non-soluble porous containers, which are securely closed to keep them unimpaired while the contained coffee is being roasted, and, after cooling, sealing them with gelatin. To brew, container and contents were dropped in a cup of hot water. This brief review of the evolution of coffee brews show that coffee making started with boiling and next became an infusion. After that, the best practice became divided between simple percolation and filtration, which have continued to the present time. Boiling has also continued to find advocates in every country, even in the United States, where it seems to die hard, no matter how much is done to discredit it. Percolation devices are subdivided into the simple drip pots and the continuous percolation machines as represented by numerous complicated and high-priced contrivances on the market. Gradually, however, true coffee lovers are realizing that the best results are to be obtained through simple percolation or simple filtration. There are good arguments for both methods. End of section 68. Read to you by J.P. Liao, Vancouver, Canada, October 26, 2022.